Welcome to the online classroom for uh, the module ECS 3706, uh, Monetary Economics. Um, we are going to be going through the entire module um, over a number of classes. Uh, it's an important economics module, just introducing you to monetary economics, what monetary economics is all about. Um, and we're going to be covering a number of important uh, learning units through the module. So it's a, it's a bit of a longish module with 26 learning units um, divided into different parts. Uh, the first part is an introduction, and then part two is on financial markets. Part three focuses on financial institutions. Part four focuses on central banking and uh, monetary policy. And then part six focuses on the important uh, monetary theory. So you might be familiar with some of the concepts we're going to be touching on um, monetary economics from your earlier studies. And uh, I hope you will find uh, the, the lessons helpful. So what we're going to do uh, with every learning unit we're going to cover, I'll be taking you through some notes uh, I've prepared on the lesson and just giving you some background, also going sometimes to the prescribed textbook and back to the notes. And then um, at the end of each, at the end of each chapter or each lesson, sorry, each learning unit, uh, based on each lesson, we'll then just discuss some questions uh, at the back of the study guide. There are all these examination type questions. So we'll do that today for the first learning unit, um, which is an introduction, uh, part one. We're going to cover uh, some learning units, uh, why study money, banking, and financial markets. And then um, we'll then also uh, look at some questions. And then in the next class, we'll continue uh, look at, looking at an overview, um, an overview of the financial system and we'll keep going through. So it's, it's a module with a lot of theory. So I'm going to be doing a lot of talking, uh, explaining things, trying to help you to really understand. Uh, and the exam also has a lot of theory. So uh, you're going to be uh, to be learning a lot as we as we cover the module. Okay, so I believe we can start. Uh, so we're going to start by looking at the first uh, learning unit under part one, introduction. So the first learning unit is just going to tell us why it's important to study money and to study banking and to also study financial markets. Okay. And then we are going to look at some important concepts with what uh, financial markets are, what bonds and stocks are, and what we mean by interest rates and securities. We'll also talk about the role of financial institutions and financial intermediaries. Uh, then we'll also talk about mining, aggregate income, aggregate price levels, and the purposes of uh, monetary policy. So the, the important thing with, to look at with regards to our prescribed textbook uh, for this first lesson and first learning unit, you need to focus on the areas that talk about why it's important to study financial markets, uh, why we need to study financial institutions and banking, uh, why we need to study money and monetary policy. So fortunately, the study guide will guide us in each lesson uh, with regards to which areas to focus on in our prescribed textbook. Okay. And then... With any learning unit, it's also important for you to just uh, go to, to uh, the beginning to just see what the purpose of the learning unit is. So this is what you need to make sure you're familiar with by the time you finish the lesson. So it's also really, really important. The, the purposes of the learning unit are always important for each class we're going to be going through. Um, and even for each introduction also, it's also important. Okay, uh, like, oh, sorry. And also for, for each part of the module, uh, there'll be certain learning 
learning units and the goals for each learning unit. So for us, we're going to start with the first learning unit, why study money, banking and financial markets. And then the goal is for us to be able to explain the meaning of financial markets and financial instruments. And then under this learning units on why to study money, banking and financial markets, uh, you need to be familiar with these learning outcomes. Okay, so we can get uh, started. Okay, so the first question we need to ask ourselves is why it's important to study financial markets. Why it's important to study financial markets. And we say that financial markets perform the essential economic function of channeling funds from households and firms and uh, government that have saved surplus funds, uh, which they save when they spend less uh, to those that have a shortage of funds. So in other words, um, in the purpose of financial markets is that you usually have two sides. You have people who have um, excess funds, like extra money, and you have people who have a shortage of funds, people who don't have enough money. Like, okay. So someone might be receiving income or uh, let's say a country is exporting, it's got a lot of money saved up in its reserves, uh, maybe through a trade surplus, like countries like China, which export a lot, or a household, you might be receiving your salary, but you are spending far less than the total amount you are receiving, so you can have excess funds. And then there might be other countries uh, which have... Uh, uh, trade deficits or budget deficits, maybe they are spending way more than what they are getting through taxes and, and everything else. Or individuals who might um, be facing difficulty financially whereby they spend all their salaries, they don't have enough money, maybe they want to purchase a house or another asset, so they've got shortage of funds. So people with excess of funds use financial markets to, to move money to people with shortages of funds, right? So it's a it's a it's a cycle. If you have excess money, financial markets will help you to to channel that money to people with shortages of funds, and then those people with shortages of funds will pay you interest through through the financial markets. So the we're going to look at how it actually works. But the idea behind financial markets is that they they act as an intermediary. They act as a bridge uh, between people who have excess funds people, uh, meaning governments or individuals with excess funds, and people, individuals with uh, governments or individuals with a shortage of funds to, to act as a bridge and an intermediary before the two. So uh, without financial markets, uh, it's hard to transfer funds uh, from a person or institution who has no investment opportunities to one who has them. So financial markets and that's important in promoting economic efficiency. So financial markets are important in that if you have um, investment opportunities, right? And you don't have any money, you don't have any funds. And then there's someone else who has no investment opportunities, but they do have extra funds. Financial markets help you with extra funds to channel them to the person who has investment opportunities. And then this person with investment opportunities will pay you some form of interest uh, because they're using your funds for their investment opportunities. And then that promotes uh, economic efficiency. So there are some keywords that we use with regards to this function of financial markets. We say that those who have saved funds, those who have extra cash and uh, they don't have any investment opportunities or anything to use the cash for, we call them lenders or savers. And then those who borrow funds, maybe because they have investment opportunities or to finance their savings, we to finance their spending, we call those borrowers or spenders. So those, with extra funds, they lend those extra funds, or we say they save those extra funds. Whereas those uh, with a shortage, with a shortage of funds, those with a shortage of funds, we say they borrow 
uh, funds or the spent funds that they've borrowed. Okay. So the, the principal uh, lenders or savers, the principal people who usually have ex excess funds are households. Uh, some households tend to have excess funds, like the money you keep in your bank account, but sometimes even companies have excess funds and even governments, like the state and local governments, even foreign or foreign companies operating in a, in a country like in South Africa. Uh, they, they might find themselves with excess funds and they might decide to, to lend them out. Uh, but primarily the principal lender savers are households, right? And then the primary the, the primary borrowers, the borrower spenders uh, are businesses. Uh, businesses borrow a lot of money, even governments, when they issue bonds, uh, they borrow these to, to finance capital investments or to fund some short-term expenses they might have, right? Uh, households and foreigners can also occasionally uh, borrow funds to help them to, to meet their short-term needs. So there's a nice diagram in the prescribed textbook that illustrates this relationship for us, right? There's a very nice diagram which shows that we have individuals with excess funds. Uh, this could be households, businesses, governments, or foreigners, uh, foreign organizations, foreign companies. What they do they put their excess funds through financial markets to financial intermediaries. This could be banks and other financial institutions. Uh, and then they also put some, okay, we, we actually say that they put some of the excess funds uh, with financial intermediaries. They put their funds with financial intermediaries. And then the other funds, they can put them directly into the financial markets, right? And then these financial intermediaries put these funds into the financial markets. So the financial markets, these are just institutions in which you can invest in financial assets or financial securities. Like, for example, um, households, businesses, governments, and uh, foreigners, they, they could buy bonds or shares. So they are actually putting their money into the financial market. So they could give their money to financial intermediaries who then put the money of those um, institutions into the financial markets, right? And then these financial markets uh, in the form of bonds, shares, that money is actually being raised in the financial markets. Whether long-term with bonds or shares or short-term with, with money market instruments, this money is actually being raised by uh, borrower spenders who are also governments and firms, um, households, and also foreigners. Or uh, financial intermediaries could also just directly lend funds to, to these borrower spenders. So this is important. Let's just read this short description to help us to understand. So the, the arrows show that funds flow from lender savers, lender savers to borrower spenders, to borrower spenders through two routes. So if a business wants money, a government wants money, a household or a foreigner, uh, meaning foreign organizations, foreign companies, or foreign uh, <clears throat> institutions, they can get the money through two sources. Uh, they can get the money uh, through uh, direct sources of finance in which the these institutions can borrow funds directly from financial markets by selling securities. So these institutions could issue shares, they could issue bonds or money market instruments in the financial markets and then they could use the cash raised from those financial instruments. Alternatively, they could also uh, obtain financing directly. Uh, so in this case, the financial intermediary would be the one that borrows the money from the lender savers. And then after borrowing the money from the lender savers, like a bank, for example, that accepts your funds, then the bank loans that money out to a business, a government, a household, or foreign uh, corporations. So there are two ways that uh, these borrower spenders can raise finance. They can either get the finance directly through financial markets or indirectly uh, through uh, other financial intermediaries, which will have borrowed directly from the lender savers. <clears throat> so uh, financial markets are really important. Uh, without financial markets, it's hard to transfer funds, and financial markets allow for funds to move 
from people with no investment opportunities to those who have such investment opportunities. We've already talked about that. And uh, they also provide efficient allocation of capital, which contributes to higher production uh, and efficiency for the overall economy. And well-functioning financial markets lead directly to the improved well-being of consumers by allowing them time, uh, by allowing them to time their their purchases. So it's uh, financial markets are really really important. Remember what we are saying here. We are asking why should we study financial markets? Why are financial markets important? And we're already seeing they contribute significantly to efficiency. Uh, in, a, in an economy. So now we're just going to talk briefly now about some of the important financial securities which are traded in financial markets. Remember these institutions, uh, they issue these securities or they sell these securities to these lender savers who buy uh, these securities. So these, these institutions can issue bonds or they can issue shares, meaning they can sell bonds or they can issue bonds or issue shares, which are bought by these lender savers who provide finance uh, through the purchase of these securities, right? So we just want to talk about these financial securities. We want to talk briefly about, um, about bonds and all the other types of uh, different securities we have, like shares. These are traded in financial markets, right? And we also just want to talk about uh, money market instruments. Remember, financial markets uh, have uh, long-term uh, securities which are traded and they also have short-term securities which are traded. We're going to look at these in detail um, in the later study units. We are really, really going to look at them in detail. Uh, but in this case, I'm just going to, to talk about them briefly as part of uh, our first learning unit, which says why should we study money, <laughs> financial markets, and banking. But we're going to talk more about those, those uh, markets and uh, when we talk about an overview of the financial system and uh, everything else. Okay. So let's talk about the bond market, not just the bond market, the bond market, uh, the, the stock market, and also interest rates. So when we talk about uh, a security, right, we're talking about a financial instrument. And basically, it's a financial instrument in which um, uh, there is a claim on the issuer's future income uh, or the asset that is sold by the borrower to the lender. So basically a financial uh, security, it's just a, it's a contractual, we can call it a contractual agreement. It's a contextual, contractual agreement stating uh, that a borrower owes a lender. Yeah, we can just define it this way. A financial security is just a contractual agreement stating that the borrower, who is the issuer, has some form of financial obligation or, or owes uh, some form of uh, obligation, usually money, to the lender, right? So we have a lender who provides money to the borrower, and then the borrower gives the lender uh, a financial security, a contractual agreement stating that yes, I have your money. Uh, so the money could be could could be given to the lender in the form of bonds. It could be given to the lender in the form of shares. It could even be given to the lender in the form of a money market instrument. Right. So bonds and shares are long term in nature, whereas money market instruments are short term in nature. So we're going to briefly talk about these, though you might be familiar with them already as to what a bond is and what a share is, right? So when we talk about financial instruments, we can divide them into two parts. We have what we call money market instruments. These are the short-term um, securities I was referring to. Usually they, they mature in less than a year, sometimes 90 days, 30 days. If a lender wants to borrow money for a short time, 
Uh, they can borrow money in the form of money marketing strings. This could be treasury bills, repurchase agreements, uh, negotiable certificates of deposits, commercial papers, retirement annuities, bankers' acceptances. We're going to talk a lot about this in the later chapters. Or uh, the financial instruments could also be classified as capital market instruments. These are, these are more long-term in nature and they come in the form of bonds and shares. So what we are now going to do in our discussion, we're just going to look at uh, capital market instruments a bit more in detail, but like I keep saying, we're going to come across these later on, but I just want to, to spend the next few minutes talking about the long-term um, uh, securities. So the, the first type of uh, long-term security that we have is a bond. We have what we call bonds. Uh, so a bond is a specific type of security, namely a debt security that promises to make payments periodically for a specified period of time. Um, so what is a bond? We know what a bond is, right? Uh, a simple example is we have a company uh, and let's say the company wants to borrow some money. Uh, the company can, can, uh, can issue bonds, right? They can sell bonds. And then investors can buy these bonds and give their money to the company. And then the company might say to the investors, look, we will pay you interest uh, may, maybe every six months uh, in the form of what we call coupon payments. And then after a certain number of years or after a certain time, maybe five years, we will pay you back uh, your money that you gave us um, in the form of the par value, right? We call it the par value, face value or nominal value. So they'll repay the loan after some years. And in between, they'll be paying coupon payments. But the investor might decide, I don't want to wait for five years. Uh, I no longer want this investment and the investor can easily take the, the bond, the, the, the security, uh, meaning that paper that's, that's stating the legal obligation that the company has to pay interest and then the face value. The investor can take that and just sell it to another investor, to another investor, I'll say investor A, they can sell it to investor A and then investor A can give them money, then they are no longer part of the transaction this investor A would now be the one who is receiving the coupon payments from the company, and then they'll receive the par value back at maturity. So a bond is essentially a loan, and uh, the bond market is really, really important. The market where we were saying, for example, investor A can buy or sell the bond is really, really important uh, to economic activity because it enables uh, corporations, companies, and governments to borrow money to finance the activities. And it's also really important because it's also where long-term interest rates are determined, okay? So what happens here is that as companies and governments issue bonds, right? As they issue bonds, it means they, they need money. And because they need money, the more bonds they issue, the more bonds they issue, it means they push up the supply of bonds. And then when they push up the supply of bonds, that forces the prices of the bonds down because there's going to be a large supply of bonds. So it means <clears throat> that the prices lenders are prepared to give you for those bonds will be pushed down because there's excess supply. They'll be looking to find a way they can give less money and still get back that face value we were talking about. And then what happens is as they push down the prices of bonds, that raises interest rates. Interest rates then go up. Interest rates have an indirect relationship between the prices of bonds. So when prices of bonds go up, interest rates go down. And when prices of bonds go down, interest rates go up. So when, when a lot of companies and governments want to raise money, want to borrow money, this will force interest rates to go up because what will happen is that the, the prices of the bonds they issue will be forced down because they'll be supplying, there'll be a high supply of those bonds. So investors will be, pre be prepared to pay less 
for those bonds, which will force the prices down and then this pushes up interest rates. So the, the bond market is really important uh, because it helps us to determine like, because it determines interest rates, right? When there's excess supply of bonds, uh, interest rates uh, go up. Whereas uh, if uh, there, there isn't a, a high supply of bonds and uh, uh, lenders and uh, lenders who have excess funds are looking for a way to put their money, if, if they, there isn't an excess supply of bonds, it means they are all chasing after uh, to lend to to a small number of corporations and individuals. So that means they, they have to put forward more money for these corporations and lenders to take up uh, that money and issue bonds, and then that pushes interest rates down. Okay. So <clears throat> when bond prices go up, uh, interest rates go down. And when interest rates go down, bond prices go up. Okay, there's an inverse relationship. So the bond market is really important because it's where uh, long-term interest rates are determined. And then interest rates are really, really important because they are the cost that uh, individuals will pay for borrowing funds. And uh, they have a serious impact on the overall health of the economy because uh, high interest rates affect uh, not just consumers' willingness to spend, but even businesses. When interest rates are high, you are more likely to spend uh, through borrowing money because you'll have to, to pay higher interest. And likewise, businesses are less likely uh, to want to borrow maybe to, to, to build a new plant or to finance any expansion because they're afraid they'll pay high interest in the future. And then that can also affect uh, the job market, employment rates, and economic growth. So bonds are the first type of uh, financial asset yeah, in the long-term capital markets. And then the other financial asset in the long-term um, capital financial markets are shares, whereas a bond is a loan, uh, a share actually represents uh, part ownership of a company. So with shares, governments don't issue shares, of course, governments only issue bonds, but companies can issue shares and bonds. And then when you actually buy shares in a company, as a lender, you're actually buying ownership of a company. So, so shares are also referred to as stock. Uh, so we, we are using an American textbook. They usually use the word stock, but in South Africa, we are more, uh, we are more used to the word uh, share, right? <clears throat> so it's also sometimes referred to as common stock or common stock or common shares. And uh, there are many different types of shares. We have what we call preference shares, uh, ordinary shares, preference shares, of course, usually have a fixed dividend even when uh, the company performs well or badly. Uh, some have deferred dividends, other dividends uh, can accumulate. Uh, whereas with ordinary shares, uh, dividends being received is at the discretion of the company. So with, with shares, there's no obligation for the person you've provided funds to, to actually pay you. Uh, interest. Remember, it's at the discretion of the board of the directors. You only get payments through dividends, or you can also sell your shares in those financial markets we were talking about after the shares have been issued. So the stock market is the market in which claims on the earnings of corporations, uh, shares of stocks are traded in SA. We refer to the trading of shares rather than stocks, like we're saying. So just like we've seen why the bond market is important, why is the stock market important? The stock market is important because the price of the shares, the actual price um, of the shares that are issued by companies when they wish to, to raise funds uh, is used to finance investment spending, right? So the price, uh, the value of shares affects uh, the amount uh, that uh, companies can actually raise for financial, for financial spending. And the higher the price of the firm's shares, the more money that can be raised to buy machinery. So when, when the prices of shares are going up, when they're going higher and higher, it's actually good for a company because they can actually raise more money by issuing more shares, which can also boost their investment spending, which can have a positive effect on economic growth. So now we've, we've gone through why it's important to study financial markets, right? 
The next thing we now want to ask ourselves is why uh, it's important to study financial institutions and banking. So remember, the whole key is uh, this, this diagram, right? We've already looked at why it's important to study this, right? Financial markets and the role that financial markets have. We now want to talk about why it's important to study financial institutions, usually financial intermediaries. Why is it, why is it important to study these? What contributions do they have to an economy and other important factors, right? So financial intermediaries such as banks and other financial institutions are what make financial markets work, right? Uh, remember, they are part of the providers of funds to financial markets, and they also provide funds directly to borrowers and spenders. So these are really, really important institutions. So without them, financial markets would not be able to move funds from people who save them to people who have productive investment opportunities. So they play an important role uh, in the economy. Okay. So the financial system, uh, which actually consists of financial markets and financial intermediaries is actually really complex. It's made up of many, many different financial intermediaries. Uh, these financial institutions, such as banks, you put your money in a bank, the bank uh, puts the money into the financial markets or to other uh, individuals looking for money, uh, borrower, spenders. Insurance companies get your premiums, then they invest them in the financial market. So do mutual funds, so do finance companies, so do investment banks. And uh, the government regulates these heavily to make sure they are not uh, misappropriating funds. And uh, financial intermediaries, they really make up the financial institutes, financial system and they allow excess funds to, to move to people who have need for cash. Okay, so that's important. So uh, banking and other financial institutions are financial institutions which can be classified as uh, financial intermediaries. They accept deposits and make loans uh, under 10 banks. So banks are financial institutions that the average person interacts with mostly. Uh, a person who needs to, to a loan to buy a house will go through a bank. So that money that you get from a bank to buy a car or a house that actually comes from people with excess funds who put their money into the bank and then the bank lends that money out to you with interest. And then, of course, we also have other financial institutions such as insurance companies, finance companies, pension funds. Usually, these are just in the form of uh, financial intermediaries where you have excess funds, you give your funds to these institutions, then they lend the funds to the financial markets. But banks are the ones that then push the funds further directly to, to individuals. So uh, it's also important to study financial institutions and banking, uh, of course, to understand their role in providing funds, uh, whether directly or through financial markets. But these institutions um, are also sometimes involved in what we call fin uh, financial crisis. And we're going to look at this further. And we refer to a financial crisis as a major disruption in financial markets uh, in which there's a sharp fall in asset prices, a sharp fall in the prices of bonds and shares. And then we've got even the collapse of a lot of financial intermediaries like banks and mutual funds. And uh, they, they come from time to time. So it's also important to study financial institutions and banking to better understand what causes financial crisis and when they can, they might occur, care. And they also tend to have negative impacts on economies. And then lastly, it's also important to study financial institutions and banking because they also help with financial innovation. Uh, they, they come up with uh, creative ways to improve the financial system, to improve the access of individuals, uh, borrowers and lenders to, uh, to the financial market so that it's easier for for money to flow through uh, in a cost-effective way, okay? And then lastly, so we've looked at why it's important to study financial markets, why it's important to study financial intermediaries, right? But when we are actually looking at this financial system, 
the thing that's actually flowing through is money. This is money, right? So it's also important to study money and monetary policy, the policy of the central bank in a particular country with regards to money. Because we've looked at this input of the financial system. Now we've looked at these two, two parts of the financial system. We now want to look at this part of the financial system, which is the money that actually flows through the financial system and the policy a central bank within a country will use to, to manage that money. Okay, so let's talk about that. So uh, money uh, is also referred to as the money supply. And we usually define it from your earlier economic studies. It's uh, usually described as uh, the generally accepted means of payment in goods or services. Okay, that is generally accept anything that we accept for the payments of goods or services or the repayment of debts within an economy. Uh, we define that as money. Now, money is really, really important uh, because it's linked to changes in a lot of economic variables uh, that affect an economy and the health of an economy. And uh, money is also important. So because it's linked uh, to, to changes in inflation, the gross domestic product, unemployment rates. So it's, it's really important to understand the supply of my, how much money there is in an economy, how little money there is, because that is going to affect our inflation rate, probably our gross domestic product and also our unemployment rates and even exchange rates. And uh, it's important to study money as well because money plays an important role uh, when it comes to um, how business cycles will uh, progress Okay, because it's actually been noted in the past that uh, the, the rate of growth in money supply has always declined before every recession. Okay, uh, though we can't always say that every time the, the growth of money supply goes down, there will be a recession. But before every recession, there's been a decline in money supply. So, so understanding money and the amount of money in an economy and how that's going is really important in helping us to understand our economy and its health. Um, even inflation, it's believed that there's a direct relationship between inflation and uh, an increase in money supply. Uh, we tend to understand that when money supply goes up, inflation tends to go up because there's more cash chasing uh, fewer goods. Uh, and then uh, money also plays an important role in interest rate uh, fluctuations. Uh, because what happens is that when money supply increases, people tend to get paid more, uh, companies receive more uh, profits, higher profits in the terms of higher, uh, uh, higher demand for goods as people purchase more, <clears throat> and then uh, prices tend to go up as there's high demand of goods. And then because of that, uh, people actually expect inflation to go up, the inflation expectations go up. And then the effect of the rise in income, rise in price levels and expected inflation, these all tend to, to cause interest rates to go up. Because firstly, individuals are going to, um, the, the monetary, uh, poly, the monetary uh, authorities like the central banks, will see that there's a high chance of inflation and they'll have inflation targeting. And then what they'll do, they'll tend to want to push interest rates to go up uh, such that they can quell uh, high inflation, like to try to, to slow down the economy. So this, this causes interest rates to go up, right? Uh, due to, to inflationary expectations, okay? And even if you're investing money anyway, you are actually going to want a higher inflation premium. If you're going to lend money to anyone, you are going to want to be compensated for the fact that inflation might be higher in the future than today. And then you will obviously demand a higher interest rate and that will push interest rates up. And then money, so we've talked about, I, I talked briefly, so now we're just going to detail with how money is actually related to inflation and business cycles and everything. So like we said, uh, there's evidence that uh, money supply always tends to decline before a recession, which can affect business cycles. 
Uh, so the upward and downward movement of the aggregate output produced by the economy seems to be greatly affected by money supply. Obviously, when there's less money circulating in the economy, um, there's less money for, for companies to invest and to pursue projects. So that tends to, to lead to a decline in the business cycle and a recession, uh, whereas when the rate of money is rising, uh, there's more money in circulation, higher demand of goods. Uh, companies are likely to be hiring, uh, offering higher wages, output is higher, and uh, jobs are usually easier to find. But that's before inflation gets too high. And then the, the central bank intervenes to try to quell inflation, uh, which then pushes interest rates up. And also people start demanding a higher premium for inflation, pushing interest rates up, which then tends to, to reduce money supply again and leads to a slowing of the economy leading to, to a recession. And then like we talked about before, uh, the supply of money is closely related to inflation. Uh, the higher the, the, the level of money supply, the high inflation rates are going to be because we've got more money chasing fewer goods. So in inflation is always usually a really, really uh, big problem for, for, for governments, central governments, and they always try to solve it because rising prices uh, can be very bad because it's, it means your disposable income. Uh, it means it really leads to a reduction in your real disposable income and you can purchase less goods. So we're just talking about why it's important to, uh, to understand money and monetary policy. Okay, so far we've seen it can greatly affect the, the level of the economy, the level of money and money supply and monetary policy. It can also affect inflation rates um, and it can also affect interest rates. So the, these are three of some of the important reasons why it's important to start money. Money has a direct impact on our inflation rates. It's got a direct impact on our business cycles and it's got a direct impact on our interest rates. A high level of money supply tends to push up our business cycle uh, because there's no more money to spend, tends to push up inflation, more money chasing uh, uh, our goods, right? Uh, more money chasing a limited number of goods. And it also tends to push up interest rates. People start to expect prices to go up uh, because of inflation due to an increase in money supply. And they will require a compensation for inflation. And also monetary policy, uh, uh, central banks will start to want to push interest rates up to try to quell the inflationary environment. Whereas a low level of money supply uh, usually occurs okay, just before a recession, less money circulating, uh, less demand of goods and services in the economy, uh, which is usually just uh, before a recession. Uh, inflation tends to be much lower. The economy slows down. Interest rates tend to go a bit down also because there's less expectations of higher inflation and investors will require a lower inflation premium. Okay, so what happens is that... Um, the central banks uh, in different countries, in America, it's known as the Fed. In South Africa, we have the South African Reserve Bank. Because they know how important money is, the level of money supply is, they try to, 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 they try to manage the level of money supply so that they can somehow manage interest rates to make sure that the economy doesn't go too slow, uh, leading to a recession and that it doesn't go too fast, leading to overheating and crazy levels of inflation. So monetary policy aims to, to try to intervene uh, in the management of money and interest rates, such that inflation is kept within a certain level, economic growth is kept within a certain level, and uh, this will just lead to the well-being of a country and a nation. So in every country, uh, there's an organization which is responsible for the conduct of monetary policies, usually the central bank in America, like we said, it's the Fed. In South Africa, it's the South African Reserve Bank. So we're going to look at all that. It's, it's part of what we're going to cover. Like if you want after the class, you can also just go and uh, you can look at your, you see, monetary uh, policy theory. We're going to cover all of that conduct of monetary policy, the money supply policy, 
the tools for monetary policy. It's going to be an interesting course covering all of this as we continue, right? <clears throat> So uh, so closely related to monetary policy, of course, is fiscal policy, uh, which rather than being directly influenced by the central bank, this is more in the hands of the government when it comes to the fiscal policy. Uh, so the fiscal policy involves decisions about government spending and taxation. Please note, with regards to the central bank, right, in different countries, central banks have different independence. In some countries, they are completely independent of the government. Um, whereas in, in other countries, the government has a great say in what the central bank is doing in their monetary policy. So fiscal policy involves decisions about government spending and taxation. Uh, so uh, some governments have what we call a budget deficit where they are spending more uh, than what they are getting in revenue through taxes. And this is usually a problem for government because it means they have to borrow. Uh, and it sometimes crowds out uh, corporations from borrowing because the government is borrowing so much in the financial markets. And then a healthier uh, sign is when a government has a budget surplus where they actually have more cash they're raising from taxes than what they're spending. And then they don't have to borrow. Um, hence, they don't crowd out uh, companies uh, in the private sector who might want to borrow. So when a government has a budget deficit, it can be a problem because it can mean they, they are crowding out uh, companies who might want to borrow um, the financial markets. Okay. So we are just about done uh, with this particular learning unit, but as we're finishing, um, I just want to encourage you to also uh, just be familiar with regards to some of these uh, definitions for some important words we have at the end of the learning unit. I might have not discussed all of them, but you should be able to know what they mean. Um, yeah, these particular words right here. I'm just trying to see these ones right here. Appendix to chapter one. Okay, these are just important, important words we've been talking about. Some of them we didn't touch on them as much as I wanted us to touch on them, but I'm going to to look at them when we look at some examination questions as per uh, the study guide discussion. This is actually going to be part of your homework, actually. And then we'll discuss it first in the next class. Um, okay, so it's, it's also important uh, just to know what we mean by aggregate output. Uh, when we talk about aggregate output, which is also our gross domestic product, we just define that as the total market value of all the final goods and services produced in the country during the course of the year. Remember aggregate output, this is closely related to what we were talking about, the level of money supply and how it can affect our GDP, right? We tend to say that um, money supply tends to decrease just before uh, a recession. That's when there's a reduction in the growth of domestic, uh, of, of, of a shrinkage of our GDP, right? And then we also have aggregate income. This is total income received for the use of factors of production and labor uh, used to produce all goods and services in an economy during the course of the year. We talked about business cycles, which are the upward and downward movement of aggregate output produced in the economy. Uh, aggregate price levels. This is the closely, closely related to our inflation rate, right? is the average price of goods or services in the country. So we can use three common measures for our aggregate price level. This is going to be part of your homework. Uh, we can use the GDP deflator, the consumer price index, and the personal consumption expenditure deflator. And then also inflation uh, is a continual increase in the aggregate price level in the economy. The price level and money supply generally rise together. So these are just some concepts I did mention, some I didn't mention as much, but as an economic student, third year, you're just supposed to be comfortable with what these terms mean. And also real GDP versus nominal GDP. Nominal GDP indicates that current prices are used to measure the GDP, whereas real GDP is nominal GDP that has been adjusted for inflation. So we're going to talk about all of these later, and you might have come across them. And then as I'm finishing, 
Uh, like I've been saying, it's important to note that uh, in South Africa, we have the South African Reserve Bank, whereas in the US, they have the Fed, the Federal Reserve Bank. And then in South Africa, we have what we call the repo rate. So this is the rate that uh, banks can lend from the South African Reserve Bank for just to manage their liquidity. But it's, it's also known as the base rate. So it's also known as the base rate. So usually when the, the South African Reserve Bank is trying to influence interest rates in the market, they do that by by adjusting the, the repo rate or the, the base rate. Whereas in America, uh, they call it uh, the, the, the fund rate. Uh, yeah, they call it the federal fund rate. It's usually just the short, the short term interest rate that central banks can actually influence directly. And then obviously, if a bank in a country, Capitec, Standard Bank, APSA, if they are now borrowing funds to manage their liquidity at a higher repo rate from the South African Reserve Bank, they'll just pass the cost onto you as a borrower in the financial market, which will affect the interest rates on your mortgage or your car purchase and everything else. Okay. And then it's also important to note that uh, the impact is largely on two aspects of the economy. Uh, so, uh, okay, this this part of the nose, I really actually have to remove this. It's actually not fitting in exactly to what we're talking about here. Uh, it was part of the earlier notes. I'll just check to see if you can see it in your study guide. Um, okay. Yeah, no, it was actually talking about the report rate. Yeah, the, the rate we were talking about, the rate that the South African uh, South African Reserve Bank sends and how, okay, yeah, therefore the changes in the repo rate impact the economy at large and then the impact is on two aspects of the economy. It can impact uh, on the volume of output and also on the aggregate price level. Okay, so in other words, we're saying that changes in the repo rate can actually impact the output. Of course, if the repo rate goes down, if funds are cheaper, if funds are cheaper for companies to get from banks and so forth, if interest rates are lower, then it will uh, increase output and real production. However, uh, aggregate price levels will go up uh, because money will be cheaper even for households and individuals as well. And they'll all want to purchase goods, competing money on uh, the, the goods being produced, which pushes uh, prices up, okay? And then uh, lastly, uh, <clears throat> the Monetary Authority in South Africa is the SARB, like we said, although the National Treasury, the Ministry of Finance also provides inputs to the South African Reserve Bank, uh, the Monetary Policy Committee of the SRB is responsible for formulating the South African Monetary, monetary Policy, and they're responsible for implementing this policy. And then remember, Listen to the news carefully. Every time um, you hear that uh, the short-term interest rate of the repo rate has gone up, you will hear that a certain number of the members of the monetary committee may be voted in favor of it, and some voted against it. So um, the committee uh, consists of a uh, of a number of uh, individuals, and what they do, they decide uh on um on monetary policy in south africa for example whether to to raise rates uh and to raise rates by how much so in south africa i'm actually seeing here that it's made up of seven members uh the governor the three deputy governors selected uh, senior officials appointed by the governor so they they come up with monetary policy and they get to vote to decide uh, when the interest rates should, the short term interest rates like the repo rate should go up and uh, <clears throat> by how much and so So some might say, let's raise rates like when inflation is a bit high. Others might say, no, let's be careful. If we raise rates, it can have a negative impact on the economy and possibly cause uh, a recession. Okay. So uh, that brings us to an end uh, of the first. Uh, learning unit that we were covering here, in which we were asking why study money, why study banking and financial markets. 
So now your task is to go through the study guide questions. Just spend a moment uh, to go through this, explain briefly uh, and in general terms, what is the meaning of a security and how it facilitates direct lending and borrowing. Explain briefly what a common stock is, what purpose it serves and how it affects businesses and investment decisions. List two ways in which the quantity uh, of money may affect the economy. Explain the difference between nominal and real GDP and the purpose for which each should be used. And lastly, list and define three commonly used measures of aggregate price level. So in the next class, uh, we will briefly discuss this homework. And then we will continue to learning unit two, <clears throat> which is an overview of the financial system. So that financial system we were looking at in that diagram, we are going to look at it in a bit more detail. And in particular, if you want to read, direct, read ahead, we're going to look at the function of the financial markets, like the structure of financial markets, the primary and secondary markets, exchanges and over-the-counter markets, uh, money market instruments, capital market instruments, uh, the function of financial intermediaries. So we're just going to go into a bit more detail with regards to some of the concepts we've been talking about earlier. Uh, we'll look at additional questions and then also the examination questions. So it's all going to be really helpful and important. Okay. So that brings us to an end of the first class for ECS 3701, Monetary Economics. I hope that class has been helpful and you learned a lot. Uh, any questions or queries with regards to anything covered in this class, you are more than welcome to let me know as usual. I won't always be able to get back to you promptly, but I'll try to do so as soon as I can. Thank you very much.